congregation in Toronto, Ontario, and welcome to our second edition of Conversations Over Coffee. Uh, today, we are really happy to have with us uh, Dr. Professor Julian uh, Zellerser, who's been one of the pioneers in the revival of American political history. He's written 20 books on American politics, uh, with subjects ranging from politics in the media to the presidency of George W. Bush. Into, in addition to his scholarly articles and books and, and chapters and so forth, Zelzer is a frequent commentator in the international and national media on political history and contemporary politics. He has a weekly opinion piece that appears on CNN.com, and he's a regular news commentator on radio, television, and in print. Uh, and has received fellowships from the Brookings Institute, the Guggenheim Foundation, the Russell Sage Foundation, and New America. Um, in addition to all of that, um, Julian um, and, his, um, and his kids are involved with Camp Ramah and the Poconos, uh, which is where I've gotten to know him because my own children are involved in the Camp Ramah and the Poconos. I think one of our kids are friends in the same Ada in the same division um, from camp um, as well. Um, and uh, we have yet another connection, Julian, which I don't know if you remember or are aware of, um, but your father and my father were both classmates at JTS. Oh, I didn't know. Um, and, uh, and so uh, Jerry's, or Julian's father is Rabbi Jerry Zelliser, um, who has, um, as I said, not only was a classmate of my father when they were both at JTS learning to become rabbis, um, but, um, but Jerry also has the unique a position of which he is very, very proud of being the first international USY president that was also the first president, the, the, the first person to also be the president of the International Association of Rabbis and Rabbinical Assembly. Um, Julian, thank you so much for joining us and for um, taking um, just 30 minutes out of, uh, out of your week uh, to be with us. And, thank you um, so much, Julian. Um, with our audience. Um, <laughs> Let's get right into it. Um, right now, let's just we're, jump into it. Um, I'd like to ask everyone to please mute yourself because we're getting the feedback of um, my own voice. Um, thank you. Um, we're living through uh, an extraordinary time historically, uh, a pandemic unlike uh, anything we've seen really since uh, 1980. What's up, fuckers? <laughs> Um, since the, uh, since 19... Oh, save me, you little shit! Ah, ah, ah. All right. I yeah. think, um, we'll have that uh, under control in a hello. minute. Hello? Um, we're living through an extraordinary time, like anything that we've seen, um, for a hundred years. Um, and of course, uh, during these extraordinary times, um, the politics of the moment impacts on our ability to face um, the challenges that are in front of us. Um, how does this moment uh, contrast to um, the historical experience in terms of politics and pandemics? Yeah, I mean, there, there are, first, it's nice to be with everyone. It's nice to be with you. Um, there's not a lot of comparable moments that we can point to. There's, there are certain things that happen in, in history where, you can't actually say, well, it's not so unprecedented. Uh, and, and this is, is uh, pretty unique. The comparisons people have made within the United States, one would be 1918 uh, with what was called the Spanish flu. Uh, and that lasted for uh, a long time uh, and created similar kinds of fears and disruptions as today. Although the entire uh, society was not shut down. We even had midterm elections take place in 1918 uh, at the height of this. Um, but that's, that's one comparison. President Woodrow Wilson was affected by this. It was part of what led to uh, his, his illness. Um, but it didn't cause the same kind of societal disruption that we have today. Closer to this would be the Great Depression, for sure, um, where the entire nation was uh, just devastated. Uh, in that case, by the economic effects of the stock market crash and high unemployment. And it just shaped our, our daily existence. It, it 
created the anxieties and fears uh, that you know we lived with in, in families uh, and in our communities. And another comparison would be World War II uh, here in the United States, not so much in the experience here on the home front, but in terms of the kind of mobilization that was required by the federal government to combat, in that case, the threat of fascism overseas. So it's kind of bits and pieces of different things, but this is truly, truly unique uh, in that in the middle of a crisis, the economy and our social institutions, our, our civic fabric have been shred and shut down uh, until we can get to a better stage. Um, what are the, the, the lessons of resiliency and recovery um, that we can learn from those previous experiences. Um, and when we look at those lessons, um, how would you say we're doing in terms of applying them um, at, to this circumstance? Well, I mean, one lesson, an optimistic lesson, is we've been through horrendous healthcare crises. Um, not all of this magnitude, but very severe, whether it was the flu in 1918, whether it was polio, uh, which was also, you know, felt throughout the world, smallpox or the AIDS crisis, which in pockets of New York City, for example, were absolutely devastating. And, and at the moment felt unending, we did get through them. So it's a, it's a kind of basic lesson and look back uh, that we've had these kinds of challenges. <clears throat> but one lesson that's very important, and I've, I've talked about this, the federal government is a necessity, it's not an option. Uh, in, in moments like this. Certainly in US history, whenever we have a crisis of this sort, markets are not sufficient, volunteerism is not sufficient. It requires the full muscle of the federal government to create some kind of economic stability uh, and to provide the kinds of resources that are absolutely essential to getting us out of that. And I think that's uh, extraordinarily important today. And finally, usually crises of, of any sort require uh, civic sacrifice. It requires citizens to sacrifice something. Uh, in World War II, here in the States, we accepted rations of food. We accepted price controls. Uh, and I think we're in a moment now where we look to the federal government, but we're also requiring a lot of people here and all over the globe, including sitting still for a while uh, and having a level of patience, which is extraordinarily difficult, but it is a form of sacrifice. Um, how does the global nature of, uh, of a virus that knows no boundaries, um, how does that change um, the political um, calculations, both within each country, but also within uh, terms of, um, uh, of, of the, the, the global community of nations? You know, it's very different. I mean, uh, globalization is something that's been going on uh, in its modern incarnation since the 1980s and 90s. Uh, and we've seen uh, there's been benefits to globalization. We are more integrated as a world community. There's more communication and commerce between nations. There's fewer rigid boundaries. And that's all been good in many ways. But globalization has come at many costs economically. It's wreaked havoc on certain communities uh, in this country after 9-11. We saw that globalization came with a certain national security risks as well that were harder to control. And now we're dealing with a pandemic and it makes it extraordinarily hard. The country, not no country, can solve this on its own. This literally requires international cooperation because the movement of people is also the movement of the disease, of the virus. And so there needs to be coordination simply to contain this. And we've seen the cost of not thinking this way. Uh, early on here in the United States, I think some of this lack or absence of, of willingness to coordinate is part of why it became so severe uh, here. So, so it requires a, a kind of post-World War II internationalism in public health if we are going to not just solve it now, this will be resolved but there will be more pandemics. I mean, talk to any public health expert. This is the world in which we live now. Uh, and so we are gonna need better international organizations to help guide us through this uh, and also to help with economic recovery. Um, you know, we will not be able to do this, to do this alone. And, and so I think on both fronts, it will be, it's a global problem and it will be a global solution. 
with, with the increasing populism and polarization of um, the political circumstance that we see um, in the world, I mean, uh, do, do we have reason to be optimistic um, that uh, that we'll be able to move in that direction, or 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 we um, should we resign ourselves to be perhaps be more pessimistic that uh, that we're going to continue to see wedges drawn between. Uh, the body politic, not only within countries, but also within the relationships between countries. I mean, it's easy to be pessimistic. And uh, we have been living uh, now through uh, over a decade where the forces of populism, nationalism here in the United States, America firstism have gotten stronger and stronger. We've seen international agreements and international institutions wither as a result of this new political uh, alignment. And uh, this has been the trend, and we've seen this in other countries as well. I guess the question is, does a crisis of this magnitude uh, shake us out of that? That's what a crisis like this can do. Uh, the 1930s depression in the United States shook the country uh, out of the notion that, you know, we didn't need government intervention to help manage the modern economy. Fascism in World War II shook us out of the idea that America would be isolated and, and could live without participating in the world. So these crises have a way of reversing basic political directions. And I think that might be the case. Nothing will scare people as much as what we're going through right now. Uh, it scares them in terms of their health and it scares them in terms of their economic well-being. And if anything could kind of push back against these nationalistic forces that we have seen, I think uh, this might be it. It won't always cut that way. It can fuel them too. Obviously, you could imagine this fuels anti-immigration sentiment. It fuels trade wars. Um, but I also think it can have this opposite effect because it's a necessity. Uh, otherwise, we will live like this uh, in perpetuity. Um, so let's turn for a little bit then about um, the opportunity that um, potentially can exist for a significant change in the United States uh, with regard to the upcoming election. Um, how do you think that's going to work? It's a good question. I, I do think many people talk about 220 in the election as if it's going to be a normal election and they're making standard kind of predictions or sorts of analysis, not just taking into account, no one's even campaigning right now. The Democratic candidate can't leave his own home uh, and it's not going to change for several months and there won't be rallies. There's not going to be a national convention. Uh, the candidates will be devoid of the traditional tools of politics. And so this will take place on social media. It will take place on television. And the president has a big advantage on both of those fronts. Endless daily appearances uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and he'll also have certain states that will be hospitable to him actually doing rallies of the sort that Joe Biden can't do. So. I think this is going to call for Democrats to really reimagine how do you sell a candidate in this particular environment uh, with limited resources. Uh, and I think uh, the Democrats are at a disadvantage because they have a candidate uh, who, for all his strengths, is not good at this. And you could turn on any appearance he's done. He's not figured out how do you get a message out. Um, and I think Democrats now are just counting on the idea that President Trump is so unpopular that just he alone can bring Democrats a victory. But we're not sure that's uh, the case. And, and I think it's going to kind of call for a real um, imagination among Democrats of how to popularize their message and, and simply even stay in the media when the media is focused entirely on the pandemic right now. Um, can you speak a little bit more specifically about what Senator Biden's challenges are yep. and uh, what strategies um, he might um, employ um, uh, to uh, try to overcome those challenges? One challenge is simply communicating on social media. Uh, that is his platform right now, and I don't think he's figured out how to do it. How to speak, what kinds of uh, speeches to even give. It's not even a speech that you give on social media. How to present himself so that people tune in. Uh, and, and, and he's going to need help. He might have to work with surrogates. He might have to uh, get advisors to help him, but he needs to figure that out. He needs to, and I know this sounds political, but that's politics, stage 
events uh, either in his room or maybe sporadically outside at some key site or name a potential cabinet, for example, so that he gets a few days where the media is paying attention to what he has to say. This is extraordinarily uh, important, I think. And you'll have to stagger them over the next few months so that people again uh, tune in. And finally, I think he has to shift much of his agenda now to a pandemic agenda. This is on the minds of voters. It will be for months to come. And I think he has to recraft what he is about uh, to focus on getting out of this, but also recovery and ensuring that we are not locked down on and on and again and again in coming years. So I think those are the three uh, challenges, which are pretty difficult for him. Um, allow me to correct myself. I should have referred to him as Vice President Biden. Mm -hmm. um, I still just remember him from when I lived in Philadelphia mm -hmm. um, and uh, he was in uh, Delaware. Um, and let me just jump in. One other thing I've talked about, this will be probably a low turnout election if everything, I think this is one of the biggest issues, uh, meaning it's if, if we're in some version of this, you're going to have low turnout because it will be difficult for people to just go to the ballot. But even if we're out of it or we're in some kind of quasi normal state, people will be worried about going. People will not want to be in long lines, touching screens, filling out papers. It's, it's highly likely turnout will be lower than usual um, unless there's some reform now that accelerates mail in voting in the states. Democrats need to think about that more than Republicans. I think Republicans are okay with a low turnout election. Uh, and I think the Biden team can't just focus on message, they need to focus on process because this is a big challenge in November. Um, so speaking about turnout, um, I think it was yesterday um, it, in this you know, self-isolation, the days are yesterday, today and tomorrow. Um, so I think it was yesterday you, um, wrote in your CNN opinion piece, um, an endorsement um, for uh, um, uh, Warren. Warren. Senator Warren um, as Biden's choice for, um, for vice president. I'm, I'm curious um, as to why you didn't consider uh, Stacey Abrams or, uh, or Kamala Harris um, as, as other choices that might um, do better um, in terms of really um, exciting um, the Democratic base and bringing people out um, to the polls come the election. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I'd say it was an argument for rather than an endorsement, um, but I did want to lay out the case why I think she's a strong candidate. I would start by saying, I, I say there's other candidates who are very formidable, including Stacey Abrams, Kamala Harris, they could all be very good, but I think she brings some things to the table, even with the potential cost of a, a Senate seat. Uh, one is she more than any of the other candidates can excite um, at this point with Sanders out that wing of the party, the younger progressive uh, activist wing, not Kamala Harris would have trouble doing that. I think that's going to be important in this election. They are going to be part of a turnout in an election. Uh, these are the exact people who can come out even in difficult circumstances. I think her agenda fits most squarely with theirs. And I think Biden bringing her on would just signal he's open to a broad conversation. Uh, he's still in charge, it's still his ticket, uh, but it has that kind of symbolic weight. She's also very good at some of the challenges we just discussed. She was very effective at figuring out ways to use this new media environment to get a message out from the selfie lines uh, to uh, her, her Twitter feed. And finally, I think there is kind of a, gonna be um, an advantage. And again, other candidates can help Biden have this of the party of, of gravitas, of governance, of ideas, uh, more than just a few months ago. Um, because I think people are desperate for leadership right now. And Biden brings some of that to the table for sure. But I think this is where her policy planning, uh, her kind of extensive work in Washington can, can be a big advantage. And, and finally, she has spoken more than anyone on one issue, which is going to be also at the forefront of people's lives now. How do middle class families feel secure and avoid the ravages of, of, of you know, debt and bankruptcy? Um, many people are facing that now, and it's only going to get worse. We might be going into a depression, uh, not just a recession. And I thought, so I think she also adds value 
uh, there. So that, that's some of the case I laid out. Um, I want to pivot for a moment. I know you have a book coming out on Abraham Joshua Heschel. Um, tell us a little bit how um, an American political historian uh, comes to write a book about Heschel. Sure. Um, I have in between, I have a book coming out on Newt Gingrich, very different. Uh, so I was thinking in a different uh, realm. Um, but Heschel, uh, two, two ways. I mean, one was my conversations with this series, the Yale Jewish Live series, which is a fantastic series if people have read some of the books of kind of short takes on important Jewish lives. And the editor uh, is interested in part um, uh, in, in finding people who have an original take on a subject, who can put it in some kind of new context. And, and I've studied a lot of Heschel's era. Uh, I've studied the civil rights movement. I've studied Vietnam and the anti-war movement. I've studied America in the 1950s. And I think part of what excited me and him was my ability to take this iconic figure uh, and put him in this much broader context and era of American history ending in the early 1970s. Second, for me, it was personally extraordinarily interesting. I am like many uh, conservative Jews, I grew up uh, seeing his image, uh, seeing that photograph in Selma, hearing his quotes during services. And I was just fascinated, kind of who was he? Uh, and, and how did he become such a presence? And obviously at a personal level, this is a, it's a different kind of project as you said in the introduction, I come from a family of rabbis. My father uh, was a conservative rabbi in New Jersey, the head of the RA. My grandfather was a product of JTS and a rabbi in Columbus, Ohio, and later Florida. So this is very much a world I know, and I kind of grew up uh, hearing about. The figures are literally the same people we often spoke about at the dinner table uh, who, who Heschel knew. So it was personally uh, wonderful. And all these things kind of made it exciting. But finally, he captures an era where uh, there was a connection between spiritual religion and progressive politics. Uh, he was not alone uh, within the Jewish community and other communities. And I wanted to use this book as an opportunity to bring that back into our memory and into our conversation. And he's just the perfect figure through which, uh, through which to do that. Uh, what's something that you learned um, about him and about that um, spiritual religion uh, and politics um, in researching and writing this book? Well, one of the themes that's really important is his intellectual work. He wasn't intellectual for most, most of his career, uh, but his writing in the 1940s and 1950s is not disconnected at all from where he ends up in the 1960s. And and one of the things I really learned the deeper I moved into his life was how his scholarship about uh, the uh, importance of, of spirituality and, and how to achieve this connection between God and man, all, most of which was written in the aftermath of the Holocaust, uh, which took many lives away from his immediate family, including his sisters and, and mother. Um, they inform where he ends up and part of why he's so excited uh, when he reaches that uh, moment of being part of the civil rights movement, and even more important, the anti-war movement in the 1960s. That connection between the theology and the activism really uh, became much clearer to me the deeper I got. Uh, and, and another thing that was, un that was important, uh, and I hope to highlight, is his work in the anti-war movement. We talk a lot about civil rights, Soviet Jewry, but that was really the centerpiece of the last part of the 60s, where he was one of the leaders of uh, a group of clergy, um, interdenominational clergy, who headed this effort uh, to stop the Vietnam War. And he was quite radical in what he said about war, what he said about American policy during this period. Uh, and, and that's yet another, another uh, surprise, I think, in the book. Um, your, your emphasis, of course, is on American uh, political history. I'm now relocated to Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Um, do you have any thoughts uh, when you look north of the border as to um, uh, the way in which Canada um, is approaching the pandemic and um, its political system in terms of how it's uh, responding to these issues? And um, what, uh, what, what comments or advice 
uh, might you have for uh, Canadians in terms of how we um, approach all of these issues? I mean, from what I've seen, there was some similarity in terms of an early uh, reluctance or uh, understanding of the magnitude of what was coming. Uh, and the political system didn't totally click in like we saw here in the United States. Uh, but now, obviously, uh, both have undertaken much stronger steps. I do think your leadership has been much more stable than what we see in the United States. And we are dealing with a truly exceptional moment to have a president who acts this way uh, in the middle of a crisis. So I think you're in better shape uh, on that front. Um, not that everyone loves your leadership, but you have kind of traditional leadership. We don't, we do not have that. Uh, and, and I think some of the tensions between the federal government and the states here is playing out uh, in a much greater way than, and I might be wrong, than what you're seeing uh, over there. We have some pretty fundamental clashes that are unfolding this week uh, between uh, a president allied with certain governors calling just to reopen everything and other governors literally standing firm, standing in the barricades saying no, both parties, uh, from Governor DeWine in Ohio to Governor Cuomo right here in New York. Um, so I think that's probably something uh, that you don't have. But, but I think the, the challenge on both fronts is the same. It's simply about uh, waiting this out at a personal level and the government in both countries helping people wait this out who can't do that economically until we can have an economic recovery that will be healthy. That's the challenge. And I think um, some of that we can do. Some of that Trudeau and the Trump administration are going to have to do. Otherwise, we're going to rush into uh, a new economy that's going to collapse within a few weeks and we'll be right back to this place. Um, so perhaps the best way to conclude this conversation is by quoting Heschel, um, his uh, famous response to a student when asked him why he was marching in Selma, Alabama with Martin Luther King Jr. was um, you know, Heschel came from a Hasidic dynasty and was one who believed in the efficacy of prayer. Um, his answer was the famous, I was praying with my feet. Yeah. Um, and um, what I've always found about that is, is that the notion of prayer, is, especially in Judaism, where the word lehit palel is a reflexive verb. Um, we, we don't pray because God needs our prayers. We pray because we need our prayers, because the words on the page and of our tradition reminds us of our core values and should hopefully inspire us to act on that. Um, and I think that's what Heschel's uh, message was when he said, I was praying with my feet. Um, it's not enough just to profess a belief. One has to act on that belief. Um, and so um, perhaps part of the challenge for our body politic is also to make sure that um, the people uh, that are the basis of that body, um, pray with their feet um, and uh, really um, let our leaders know what it is that we expect of them, uh, both in terms of their behavior, but also in terms of the types of policies that bring us not only to good health physically, but good health economically, um, and also, God willing, good, good health spiritually and emotionally. Uh, Julian, thank you so much for being with us. Um, look forward to continuing to follow you on CNN um, and in your other places of writing. And when your book on Heschel comes out, let's talk again and maybe you'll come to Toronto um, and we'll spend more time together. Looking forward to it. And thanks for having me. And thanks to everyone. Stay healthy. Thank you, Julian. Bye.